for all coming out and thank you for inviting me. But um, there's a certain paradox here. I'm going to say some nice things about courage and how important it is and how we ought to be courageous. And you are probably thinking, how does he practice what he preaches? Is he a courageous person? Well, to have a typical philosophy professor talk about courage is a bit like having Donald Trump talk about politeness. <laughs> <laughs> But talk I must, uh, for a little while anyway. We have only an hour, I have to catch a plane, so we have to leave by one. So I want to leave at least half that time for the much more important thing, namely dialogue. Your questions, my answers, and vice versa. Dialogue is much more interesting than monologue, as everybody knows. And in fact, I suspect that you sit politely through a monologue only in order to get to the dialogue. Uh, you're Catholics, you know that most of us get to heaven only through purgatory, so <laughs> I'll try to shorten your purgatory. Uh, three main points. You know, Southern Baptists are experts at preaching, and they say every sermon ought to have three points. First you tell them what you're going to say, then you say it, then you tell them what you said. Uh, my three main points are the relation between courage and truth, the relation between courage and the other virtues, and the relation between courage and facing death. Uh, what is courage? Well, courage is one of the four cardinal virtues. And it means the mastery of the irascible appetites, that is, the passions of aversion, things that we naturally don't like. Uh, similarly, temperance or self-control or moderation is the mastery of the concupiscible appetites, namely the uh, desires for things that we do like. Uh, desires are neither good nor bad. They're raw material, which can be shaped well or badly. So what makes a virtue is not a feeling or a passion or an emotion, but a choice to impose a certain order or structure or form on those virtues. Uh, this is why Aristotle, master of common sense, says that there are almost always two opposite vices, which are the opposite of every virtue. Uh, the most obvious opposite of courage is cowardice, but an equally opposite ver uh, vice that is the opposite of the virtue of courage would be foolhardiness. Because some of us have a natural fear of suffering and pain, uh, we can deal with that fear by exaggerating it or by trying to eliminate it. Uh, refusing to risk harm uh, for a uh, a good is, of course, cowardice, but rushing into harm for no reason at all uh, is simply silly, and that's foolhardiness. <coughs> uh, similarly, the appetites, the uh, concupiscible desires, the positive uh, feelings. Uh, we should have an appetite for food, and for beauty, uh, and for sex, and if somebody doesn't, that's a, a, a kind of a, a defect. But most of us have much too much of an appetite for beautiful things, so we need to regulate it. So the essence of all the virtues is the joining together of the reason's blueprint, so to speak, uh, and the passions and emotions of the body and the animal feelings. Uh, putting them together. It's not a purely spiritual thing, it's not a purely physical thing. And therefore, courage is not the same as fearlessness. Fearlessness is uh, an emotional gift that some of us are given, uh, and others of us are not given. What you do with that raw material, that feeling, or those sets of feelings, uh, is either a virtue or a vice. Uh, because we live in a very psychological culture, because we, we tend to reduce everything to feelings, because we, we concentrate so much on our feelings, uh, we tend to reduce virtues to feelings, and that's a mistake. In fact, if we read the uh, teachings of the great saints, one of the shocks that we will have if we're typical Americans is how little credit they give to feelings. Yeah, there are feelings, and, and, and they motivate us most of the time, but that doesn't make them <coughs> bad. Don't worry about feelings. Oh, but, but when I receive the Eucharist, I have no pious feelings at all. Fine, you're in the dark night of the soul. Uh, that's God's will for you. Good. 
Did Jesus have nice, sweet feelings when Judas betrayed him or when he was dying on the cross? No. <clears throat> feelings don't matter that much. What matters is what you do with them. All right, so courage is the, uh, the proper application of wisdom or prudence, which is the first and most important of our four cardinal virtues, to the irascible appetites or the negative appetites. And therefore, courage has an essential dependence upon wisdom and upon the object of wisdom, which is truth. Those two things naturally go together, courage and truth. If you know nothing about truth, you cannot possibly have any courage at all. Alexander Solzhenitsyn understood that very well. Before June 2nd, 1978, almost the whole world regarded Solzhenitsyn as the greatest living writer, the new Dostoevsky, uh, a, a great mind. He was a Soviet dissident. He spent most of his life in concentration camps in Siberia. Uh, he came to America, uh, and he gave the Harvard commencement address. And there were 20,000 people present there. Uh, and he shocked them by two things. The first thing he said is, I noticed that uh, here at Harvard, uh, you have a, a, a holy word, which is Harvard's motto. It's the word veritas, which is Latin for truth. Everyone was quiet. They thought, nobody talks about truth at Harvard anymore. How old-fashioned. He dared to say the T word. And then he said, uh, coming to your country, and I'm grateful for your hospitality, and I certainly don't recommend my dictatorship of, of communism to you, but, but coming to your country, I find something missing in America that it kind of shocks me. That's not missing in Russia. And everybody was quiet, and he said, courage. <clears throat> courage? He explained in more polite words than these, but I'm summarizing it very quickly. Uh, you don't need courage. You have no suffering. You live in a bubble. Uh, you have no need for heroism. Uh, we do. We have a wicked society, but, uh, but it produces many, uh, many saints. We're interesting. You're boring. <laughs> there are great Russian novels. There are no great American novels. Well, instantly, his reputation knows diet. And if you want an index of the decline of Western civilization, Google up the editorial page of letters to the editor in the New York Times the seven days following his commencement address. He was raked over the coals by almost everybody, including the president's wife. How dare he say that to us? How dare he say you're, you're spiritually declining? How dare he say you have forgotten God? What does he think he is anyway? An expert? <clears throat> Well, it's one of the great speeches in the history of Western civilization. Everyone should read it. But the relation between courage and truth is something that most people don't realize, uh, at least in this country. Uh, in a totalitarian dictatorship, you have to realize that. It takes courage to speak truth to power. <coughs> Joseph Pieper, author of the book The Four Cardinal Virtues, which is a classic, and I highly recommend it as the very best book I've ever written. Uh, well, read, <laughs> <laughs> read on the four cardinal virtues. Someone once said to me, you've written a lot of books, you must have written more books than you've read. I thought that was an insult at first, but then I said, maybe that's a compliment, I don't know. <laughs> Pieper, in the four cardinal virtues, says that the whole ordered structure of the Christian view of man rests upon the preeminence of prudence over the other virtues. Uh, the word prudence, like the word courage, is usually misunderstood. For the same reason, it's reduced to a, a feeling. Most people think of prudence in the same way that they think of prunes, uh, something uh, very safe and, and conservative and not exciting. Uh, don't take chances. In fact, prudence and courage are usually thought of as opposites. Courage means be, be fearless and take foolish chances, and prudence means uh, uh, shrink back and, and be super careful. Uh, both are mistakes. Prudence simply means practical wisdom, understanding true values, having a, a clear, ordered blueprint in your mind that you can try to impose upon your life and your passions. 
uh, upon two things. Aristotle says the matter or raw material of every virtue is two things, physical actions and emotional passions. But the form of the virtue is always determined by practical wisdom, what you ought to do. Uh, so wisdom is the virtue that's relative to truth, and therefore courage is relative to truth, and therefore to wisdom. Pieper says, as truth is relative to being, so goodness is relative to truth. It must be the true good. This is very different than the ordinary common mind that regards prudence and fortitude as contradictory ideas. Prudence, in fact, is the cause of all the other virtues being virtues at all. There may be a kind of instinctive governance of instinctual cravings, but only prudence transformed this into the virtue of temperance. And the same is true of, of courage. Prudence is also the measure of justice, because it must be true justice. Justice perceiving what people deserve. True humanness, then, consists in this, that reason, and here's another word that's often misunderstood, reason is not just calculation. That's what Aristotle called the third act of the mind. Reason is, first of all, understanding, the first act of the mind, and judgment, the second act of the mind. Reason, in the old ancient sense of the word, perfected in the knowledge of truth, must shape and imprint man's choice and activities. So whoever rejects truth is truly wicked and in fact beyond conversion. To deliberately reject truth, that's probably the best candidate for the unforgivable sin. If you don't want light at all, nothing follows. The best surgeon in the world can't perform the simplest operation in the world in a hospital that the lights have gone out in. I think the most radical mistake ever made by any of the great philosophers, uh, and you have to be great to make a great mistake, uh, was Nietzsche's uh, most dangerous question. He says, I shall now ask a question which no one has dared to ask before. It is the most dangerous question you can ask. And the question is, why truth? Why not rather untruth? He said, no philosopher dared to ask that question. They all contradicted each other as to what the truth was, but they all agreed with each other that there ought to be a will to truth. He questioned that. Uh, well, he was at least consistent, and he lived his philosophy. He was a martyr to his philosophy. He died after 11 years in an insane asylum. Because the clearest measure of insanity is either not to care about or not to be able to discern the difference between truth and the lie or truth and, and fantasy, or uh, the dream world and the real world. The very first thing Jesus ever said in John's Gospel, his first public words were, what do you want? A profound question. Wants come from our heart. Our heart determines everything else. Solomon says in the Proverbs, out of the heart are all the issues of life. If you truly want what God is, you will get it. If you don't, you won't. And the first thing that God is is truth. The second thing that God is is love. And those are two absolutes. And no one must ever compromise either one, ever. And if there seems to be a contradiction between the two, there aren't. Pieper goes on, we all tend to misunderstand Thomas Aquinas' words about reason perfected in the cognition of truth because reason to him means regard for and openness to all of reality, and acceptance of reality. And truth to him is the unveiling and revelation of reality. It's not just an opinion. It's not just correctness. Certainly not just political correctness. And without that, nothing follows, including all the virtues, including courage. To be brave, a man must first know what the good is, and he must be brave for the sake of the good. Even to take death upon oneself is not in itself praiseworthy, but solely because of its subordination to the known good. Therefore, fortitude, though it puts men to the severest test, being ready for martyrdom, is not the first and greatest of the virtues. For neither difficulty nor effort causes virtue, 
but only the good. And since the good is known by prudence or practical wisdom, uh, without that there is no courage. The virtue of fortitude or courage has nothing to do with a purely biological or emotional daredevil spirit. Fortitude is not determined by risking one's person arbitrarily, but only by a sacrifice of the self in accordance with reason, that is, with the true nature and value of reality, of real things. Well, seeking the truth requires a kind of courage, something analogous to courage. It requires effort, which often involves some suffering. It involves persistence and perseverance. And since we're lazy, there's a kind of suffering involved there. It requires patience. Since we're naturally impatient, it requires a kind of suffering there. Those are sufferings that are worth enduring for the sake of the truth. Unless you seek the truth, you won't find it. Jesus says, seek and you shall find. What's he talking about? Money? Power? Prestige? Of course not. He's talking about truth and love. He's talking about what he is. All who seek and find it. What you find there is that if you don't seek, you won't find The difference then between heaven and hell is not the difference between those who have found and those who have not found. It's the difference between those who seek and those who do not seek. Because all who seek eventually will find, just a matter of time. And that requires effort and that requires courage. Not only seeking the truth, but accepting the truth, once it's found, often requires courage because the truth is often bitter, inconvenient, and unwanted, and demanding, and embarrassing, and shocking, especially to our pride. Oh, I thought this. I was wrong. wrong. I can't say that word. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite TV episodes is in the old uh, classic Happy Days, where Fonzie, who is very, very cool, uh, has to... Uh, confess to Ralph Mouth, who's not at all cool, he's a kind of a geek, uh, that he, Fonzie, was wrong when he, Fonzie, involved, advised him, Ralph, to join the Marines to get some water in his life. And Ralph's a very unhappy Marine. And uh, Robbie, who's a wise man, truly wise man of the group, persuades Fonzie that uh, in order to save uh, Ralph's life, he has to go say he was wrong. And Fonzie tries to do that. Finds Ralph. There he is in his uniform, he's looking very miserable. As soon as he sees Fonzie, he's his hero, he uh, brightens up and says, Ah, Fonzie, great, great to see you again. Thanks for the advice. You know, this is the meaning of life. You, you saved my life. Well, I don't know about that. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, you know, when I told you that you'd make a good Marine, you know, yeah, 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 Fonzie, what? You know, I was, I was, you were what, Fonzie? I was raw. I can't say that word. It's not cool. The W word. We've all got to say it. In order to get to heaven, you've got to say it. I was wrong. It's called repentance. Ooh, that takes courage. All right, so it takes courage to seek the truth. It takes courage to accept the truth once you find it. It takes courage to profess the truth where it's unpopular. And the greatest truths are almost always unpopular. You speak truth especially to those who don't know it. And they're not going to say, thank you very much. I'm instantly converted. You're right, I'm wrong. Uh, they're going to scorn you. They're going to say, what an idiot. <laughs> and that's a suffering. That's at least an emotional suffering. So, courage and truth go together. What about the other virtues? Well, let's look at the other natural cardinal virtues. Let's take Look at courage and justice. And then look at courage and self-control. And then let's look at the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Courage is, courage is deeply related to justice because justice, like courage, is totally defined by truth and therefore by wisdom, which knows the truth. Because justice is simply the truth about right and wrong, what is deserved and not deserved. Now, there's a lot of courage there. It takes courage to say that. It takes courage to 
love justice, especially when you're somewhat unjust and you have to change. It takes courage to endure your just punishments. And sometimes it takes courage to administer them, especially if parents to children. Parents often say to children, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Children don't understand that, but parents do. Courage also is required for self-control, that is, moderation or temperance. This virtue is also defined by truth, by the true order of the passions. Uh, and self-control means that the thing that makes you immediately happy must often be sacrificed and said no to. Even when it's perfectly innocent, that's why you fast during Lent. There's nothing uninnocent about food. But since we all love it too much, and the same with drink, and the same with other earthly pleasures, it's a necessary thing for us to do, if we're to develop any kind of self-control at all, to be able to say no to the things that are, are perfectly innocent, as well as to say the things that are uh, no to the things that are wrong. Uh, the opposite of that is a very deadly condition. It's called addiction. <laughs> Gotta have it. You're a slave to whatever you can't part with that is less than yourself. If you're not detached from the good things in life, you're a slave, you're an addict. Nothing wrong with money, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with riches, but they're very dangerous because uh, it, you naturally get addicted to them. Thomas Aquinas wisely says that uh, uh, money is much more dangerous than even the things that money can buy, because the things that money can buy are naturally limited. You can't really desire 12 gourmet meals a day, you can only enjoy three. But you can desire $10 billion if you have only five, or five if you only have any one. Uh, that, that, that's infinite. Uh, and that's got to be curbed. Now, what are you addicted to? What can't you possibly give up? Uh, this is rather embarrassing, but I think the answer to that question for most teenagers today is their smartphones. They live with their smartphones. I, I, I did a little experiment in class. Uh, I often give suggestions for extra credit essays in philosophy class. So I said, write an essay on how my world changed during the 24 hours that I resolved not to look at any screen, any smartphone screen, any computer screen. So far, I've gotten about 10 essays, and at least half of them were very similar because they said the same thing. I thought I could do this. I thought I could hold out for 24 hours a day. I can't. I cannot live without my smartphone. That's my identity. Well, that's what it is. <coughs> Doesn't matter what you're addicted to. If you're enslaved to it, you're enslaved. And you've got to free yourself. Why? Because of the truth. Because that's not your true good. It may be perfectly innocent, but your relationship to it isn't. And, of course, that takes courage. You are addicted to it only because it gives you some kind of pleasure. The devil's strategy for tempting us is extremely simple. He's a fisherman. No fisherman puts uh, a scary, ugly-looking hook in the water without baiting it by an attractive, wiggly, tempting, tasty-looking worm. The devil does the same thing. That's why you won't be tempted to sin in heaven, because you'll see things perfectly clearly. You'll see evil as the ugly thing that it is, and you'll see good as the beautiful thing that it is. But in this life, we don't have that clear vision. Evil often looks like good, because the devil's very clever at putting worms on the hook. And that leads us into the necessity of the virtue for faith. Faith, like practical wisdom, is relative to truth. Faith is x-ray vision. Faith is seeing what's really there. The old Baltimore Catechism's definition of faith is very simple. Faith is that act of the mind prompted by the will by which we believe everything that God has revealed to us on the grounds of the authority of the one who has revealed it, the only one who can never either deceive or be deceived. Very simple, very commonsensical. In the words of the famous Southern Baptist preacher, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's not simplistic fundamentalism, that's wisdom. Faith, then, is defined by truth. Uh, first of all, because it has to be the true faith, not fake faith. And, and mere sincerity is not enough. 
uh, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to know the truth as well as want it. Uh, and faith object of truth. If we're honest, the only honest reason for anybody ever to believe anything at all, sacred or secular, is because it's true. Well, you might think, aren't there other good reasons? Aren't there other values? Yes. How about moral goodness? Isn't that important? Oh, yeah, for extremely important. More important than truth? Well, I don't know. How about happiness? Everybody wants happiness. It's the end. Everyone seeks everything else that they seek for the sake of happiness. And no one seeks happiness for the sake of anything else. Why do you play golf? Because it makes you happy. Nobody says, I want to be happy so I can play golf. So, are these two goods, which are very important, more important than truth? William James, one of my favorite philosophers because he's very commonsensical, says that there are two kinds of people, the tender-minded and the tough-minded. And the tender-minded uh, think that happiness and moral goodness are the, the, the highest ends. Uh, and the tough-minded think that truth, the facts, knowing what is, is the highest end. And if you have two people, one of whom is tender-minded and the other of whom is tough-minded, they have opposite presuppositions, opposite absolutes, and they'll never agree. Well, I'm a little more optimistic than James. I think that deep down he's wrong, because I think we are all, deep down, tough-minded. I think I can prove that to you. Is there anybody in this room who literally believes in Santa Claus? No, huh? Well, I don't want to destroy your faith. <laughs> but remember when you were three years old, you believed in Santa Claus. Every December 24th, you had these two precious things that made you very happy, and it made you very good, at least your behavior. Your motive may have been selfish, but still, behavior counts. So, it made you happier and better to believe in Santa Claus. I don't know why you don't you believe in Santa Claus today. If you did, you'd be happier than you are, and you'd be better than you are. There's only one possible reason. It's not true. Oh, look how tough-minded you are, how honest you are. Hmm. All right. Well, faith is a kind of honesty. Some people think of faith as a kind of dishonesty. Faith is believing in the unbelievable. Well, that's self-contradictory, that's meaningless. If it's unbelievable, then it's literally unbelievable and nobody can believe it. And should you have reason for your faith? Of course. Leaping in the dark? Ridiculous. Leaping in the light, that's good. Let's say you're in a burning building, you're on the 20th floor, uh, and there's no way out. The hallway is full of flames. And you look out the window, and you can see a fire truck there, but you can't see the fireman standing on the ground because there's too much smoke. So your, your sight is limited. And you hear a voice saying, jump, we have a, a, a safety net here. Now, that's a leap of faith. You don't have certainty, you don't have proof that the fireman will catch you. Is it reasonable to jump? Of course it is. But you have to have some reason. It's not just an arbitrary leap. Well, that's like faith. Or let's take marriage. Here, Romeo comes to Juliet and says, marry me, even though your family hates me. Elope with me. Uh, and she can say yes, and she can say no, so it's a leap of faith. But he doesn't come with proofs. He doesn't come with a battery of philosophers proving by syllogism that she has to marry him. <laughs> he doesn't even come with a lawyer with a prenuptial agreement. He says, trust me, jump into my arms. That's religion. That's what God does to us. God wants to be our spiritual husband. So it is a leap. But there have to be good reasons for the leap. Prudence comes first. Practical wisdom comes first. In fact, we're commanded by the first pope, St. Peter, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, an unreasonable, a totally unreasonable faith is not a virtue at all. It's, it's foolishness. What about hope? Does that require a kind of courage, as does faith? Well, yes, because hope, too, is defined by the truth. That is the object of wisdom, which is intrinsically connected to courage. Hope is not just a feeling, there again, we often reduce it to a feeling, a uh, kind of optimism, you know, everything will be all right. It's not a virtue. Hope is faith devoted to the future, directed to the future. Uh, hope is faith in God's promises. 
and his promises are astonishing. Uh, they're not easy to believe. It, it takes a struggle. How, how hard is it to believe one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible, Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good for those who love God. Well, it certainly doesn't look like it. All sorts of things in your life and in other people's lives seem to be meaningless and pointless, and you don't see all things working together for good. Can you believe that God does work all things out in the end for good? Well, of course you can, and it's very reasonable. Why? Because the three most non-negotiable attributes of God, the three attributes that God has to have in order to be called God at all, uh, have to be uh, wisdom and power and love. A God who is stupid is not God. A God who is weak is not God. And a God who is wicked is not God. Well, if God knows everything, including what's best for you in the end, and if God has the power, providentially, to arrange all the events in your life to work for that end, and if God's will for you is pure love, pure altruistic love, then it follows from those three non-negotiable premises that all things must, in the end, work together for good, even though we don't see it. And that's God's basic answer to the problem of evil. The great classic of the problem of evil is the book of Job. And Job's a great philosopher. He asks very good questions. Uh, and he dares to challenge God so much that he thinks he's going to die. The Jews believed that no man could see God's face and live. And Job wanted to see God's face. He said, let, let him kill me. But I, I've got to know the truth. God finally shows up. Job survives. And does God answer any of Job's questions? None. Not a one. All he says is, were you there when I designed your life? When the angels were singing together, when I created and designed the world. I didn't notice you there giving me advice. Oh, really? Then you've got to trust me. And that's the essence of religion. That's hope. Courage is necessary for hope because hope endures present distress and present ignorance. Courage has the same relation to hope as it has to faith. It's a necessity. No doubt, to die without hope, says Joseph Pieper, is harder and more fearful than dying in the hope of eternal life. But who would be willing to accept such nonsense as this, that it is more courageous to enter death without hope? This is ridiculous. Yet, if you take not the end, but the effort as the measure of good, you can hardly avoid this ridiculous conclusion. As St. Augustine says, it is not the injury that makes the martyr, but the fact that his action is in accordance with the truth. Finally, the most important virtue of all is charity. Uh, that too is defined by truth. Uh, for Aquinas, the greatest act of charity you can do to your neighbor is to lead him to the truth. Because that's the first requirement of all virtue. Uh, and charity has to be not just love, but true love. The essence of love. The will to the good of the other. And it takes courage to love the other because we're all pretty ugly and unlovable and uh, distressing. I love Mother Teresa's use of that word. Uh, Mother, Mother, why do you why do you go into the gutter and, and, and pick up all these these ugly tramps who don't even have any faith? Well, it's Jesus in his distressing disguise. Jesus loves to disguise himself. He says, whatever you do to one of the least of these, my brethren, you do to me. That's Jesus in disguise there. What's Jesus doing in the Eucharist? He's being disguised. No, he's disguising himself. It's an action. Uh, remember the Latin words of Thomas Aquinas' his great Eucharistic hymn. Uh, Adoro te devote latens de tas, God who's hiding. Under these appearances, very latitas is really doing something there. He's hiding. Like a little kid hiding behind a costume. God hides to test our faith. That takes courage. 
Uh, it takes courage to fight. To fight what? Our enemies. Do we have enemies? The Bible says we do. The word is used hundreds of times. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. Your enemies are not the wrong political party. Your enemies are not uh, Planned Parenthood or the ACLU or, 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 or even tyrants. Who are your enemies? First of all, your own sins. Oh, where do they come from? Well, ultimately, they come from hell, from demons. Uh, direct assaults by demons are rare, but demons are behind the whole system of temptations. And they are our enemies, and we are to fear them and hate them and fight with them and try to kill them. If, if you don't fight, you'll lose. We are at war. Uh, life is love, but life is also war. And if you don't realize that, you're going to lose. As C.S. Lewis says in his classic, The Screwtape Letters, the devil equally loves two mistakes to make about it. One, to take him too seriously, and to worry that he's as powerful as God, and to be obsessed with him, uh, which is perhaps the mistake many of our ancestors made. But our typical mistake is the opposite, to, to ignore him entirely, or even to deny his existence. Well, if there's no devil, Jesus is a fool. We talked a lot about him. We actually met him and overcame him. And why should we hate our sins? Because we love ourselves. We must love ourselves. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. You either love both or you hate both. So for the love of the sinner, you hate the sin. Just as for the love of the patient, the uh, surgeon hates the cancer he's trying to kill. Which brings us to my last point, the relation between courage and death. The willingness to die, martyrdom. The sacrifice of not just some things, but everything. Because in, life, in death you lose everything. We are incredibly vulnerable. Any one of us could die at any time. All it takes is an invisible microorganism to kill you. And you can never be sure. But we are vulnerable. That's why we need courage. Courage presupposes vulnerability. Without vulnerability, there's no courage. Angels are not vulnerable. They don't have bodies. So angels don't need courage. We're not angels. We do need courage. We are able to suffer loss and injury. And the willingness to suffer it, if necessary, is courage. And the supreme injury is death. The ultimate injury. Uh, all the little injuries, all the little losses, are preparations for death, little deaths. Fortunately, uh, God prepares us for the great act of courage in the end, the need for the little ones along the way. Every other religious teacher came in the world into the world to live and to teach. Jesus came into the world to die. Uh, and it's not just his teachings, it's his death that saves us. Everybody else, Socrates, Buddha, <coughs> Muhammad, Zoroaster, Confucius, Lao Tzu, said, uh, this is my mind, follow it. Uh, Jesus didn't save us, first of all, by saying, this is my mind. He saved us, first of all, by saying, this is my body. The difference between Christianity and Buddhism is very deep. There are profound similarities, too. Uh, the, the peacefulness, the, the state of mind, uh, the control of thought. Buddhists can teach us a lot of good psychology. But the ultimate aim of Buddhism is to overcome suffering. Suffering is caused by desire. If you don't desire what you don't have, uh, you're not frustrated and you don't suffer. So the greater the gap between what you desire and what you get or what you have is the measure of your suffering. And Buddha says, quite brilliantly, the only way to abolish all suffering is to abolish all desire. Well, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say suffering is the greatest problem in human life. In fact, the way to solve the greatest problem in human life, which is sin, separation from God, the way to solve that problem is through suffering. That's the only way Jesus saved us, through his passion and death. And if Jesus is not an exception or a freak, but our model, we too can only be saved by suffering. 
We have to give up ourselves and our own will and our own pleasure. And if you don't do that, you can't be saved. That's the, the pattern, the process. There's no other way out. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not joy involved, too. St. Catherine of Genoa uh, wrote a number of dialogues on purgatory. She had visions of purgatory. And obviously, purgatory means purgation, which is a kind of suffering. C.S. Lewis, who was not even a Roman Catholic, uh, believed in purgatory and described it this way. He said, when you, when you die and you show up on the front door of God's heavenly mansion, uh, God will say, welcome, my child. Uh, you are mine, you are deeply loved, and you are welcome here. And there is a great banquet going on in the dining room. But, but if you look at yourself, you'll see that you're really dirty, and you smell, and you've got bugs all over you, and there's uh, uh, spiders in your hair. Wouldn't you like to go to the bathroom and take a nice hot shower first? And wouldn't you say, oh, oh, Lord, please let me take the shower? And you'd say, oh, well, I warned you it's going to hurt. And wouldn't you say, well, let me take it anyway? Well, St. Catherine of Genoa says she saw two things about purgatory. First of all, you see all the horror and ugliness of your sins. How awful they are. They're not just ordinary human peccadillos. Well, everybody does it, so it can't be too bad. It's saying no to absolute truth, goodness, and beauty. God. And it hurts other people much more than you think. And you see that, and you would rather exchange that for any suffering on earth. There's greater suffering in purgatory spiritually, whether it's physically or not is, is uncertain, uh, than, than, than could be on earth. But, she says, the joy in purgatory is infinitely greater than any joy on earth because you're absolutely guaranteed heaven. You've seen God already. You're deprived of him for a while while you're being purged. But you're absolutely guaranteed eternal salvation. And he's there, and you know it, willing your purgatory and holding your hand. Well, that's kind of scary, but also wonderful. White life itself. So, have a happy purgatory and have a happy life. And it's time for questions. I didn't need nearly enough time, only 15 minutes. Well, let's get as many questions as we can. All right, so please join me in thanking everybody.